I was a career U.S. nuclear submarine officer. I was on an aircraft carrier called the USS George Washington in Yokosuka, Japan, which is our first nuclear aircraft carrier permanently forward deployed in Yokosuka. Uh, there we also have a pretty big Navy presence, you can imagine, with an aircraft carrier. With, uh, and I was home writing my retirement speech when the earthquake struck. So for me, it was, uh, it was an interesting experience because I grew up in California. And as many of you here, I'm sure, have felt earthquakes before. And most tremors that I was used to lasted like a few seconds, and then you could get on with business. But this thing lasted over five minutes. And for me, that was a little unnerving. And I, like I said, I grew up around earthquakes. Uh, and I thought it was massive. This is the picture of Japan. Yokosuka is, uh, like I said, a naval base about 35 miles to the south of Tokyo. That's about the distance between here and uh, Tacoma City. So at 2.46 in the afternoon, on a nice Friday afternoon, a 9.0 earthquake hit Japan. The closest major city was Sendai, with a population of 1 million. And from what I understand, uh, looking at the U.S. geological site, um, it moved the island about 8 feet to the east. And it actually caused the Earth to tilt in its axis by about 4 inches. Pretty big earthquake. It caused extensive damage in the area in northern Honshu called Tohoku. And if you look on this map in the yellow, that's where pretty much the tsunami damage occurred. And then the purple are the, are the prefectures most affected. The tsunami reached inland six miles. So as you can imagine, the government was in a state of crisis and chaos in dealing with this tremendous destruction and human suffering. It was ill-equipped to handle the additional complexity of simultaneous nuclear uh, reactor accidents. As the lead U.S. Uh, representative equipped, it was like having the San Francisco earthquake, Hurricane Katrina, and Three Mile Island all on the same day. Told that you see up on the screen with the deaths and the missing and they evacuated. That took months for the national police in Japan to, to accumulate. You must respond immediately. As I said, the Navy had a big, pretty big presence, but overall, we had 100,000 people permanently deployed in Japan. Now, the military always has to do this, so we call this thing, we gave it a name, it's called Operation Tomodachi. Since I was, uh, had been relieved of my job and I'm newly trained, I had a different opportunity at the time. Uh, I, I was selected to go help out with the U.S. response team, and, and just to make this clear, my response and the U.S. response team was not going up to the site with the fire hose or anything. My response was go to the embassy, where we, where we gathered our uh, collective knowledge, and we brought in lots of experts from the United States. We formulated plans, we tried to bring in equipment, uh, we tried to figure out with the Japanese government what the best policies for it was. So my situation was, this is what I did for the following year, was to try to determine what was the best course of action, both for the United States citizens, for the Department of Defense, and for the Japanese government. Here are the key big picture conclusions I began telling folks uh, several months after the accident, because one of my jobs is also to, to go to the U.S. family members and to talk to them and give them some assurances that they weren't in the immediate danger. And here we are seven years later, and this slide really hasn't changed. I'm going to say the same thing again. So with TV camera streaming and satellite dishes pointed right at the crisis, the worldwide viewing public got a first-hand uh, seat, first uh, row seat to this crisis. And they were getting information almost, well, I would say, as fast as the government was. So whereas people tend to turn to the government and say, give us more information, this was the feed they were getting, just in real time, just like we were. The flooding and the tsunami destroyed a bunch of communications channels, and they really lost information from the site as well. So they didn't know what was going on, but they started telling things to people to give them some reassurances. Uh, and that did not set well with the Japanese public, who already had a low opinion of government and a low opinion of the electric power company. So lacking any trustworthy sources of information, the press filled the airwaves with self-proclaimed experts. And so in this picture, in this selected couple, are two smart, educated people that are technically trained, 
you should know better than to reach beyond their expertise. <laughs> but they had no shame in doing so. And they started saying things that were just not true. And then there's two here, and I don't want to point them out. <laughs> they confuse reality with reality TV. <laughs> so that's what we got. The government of Japan struggled with trying to get information flow that was accurate out to people. So what they ended up doing is the Prime Minister probably said, look, we're just going to be completely transparent about everything. We're going to set up websites, every ministry, every piece of government, and a lot of it was even in English. And so for me, it was not a Japanese speaker in the U.S. team. This was really valuable information for us. And we were able to see and understand a lot of things. But the problem is, although it's strange, it's too much information. Mm -hmm. And even for someone like me that's kind of trained in this business, there was such volume that we couldn't get through it to even make sometimes a coherent picture of what we were looking at. And so even the experts were a little bit overwhelmed by the amount of data. And so there again, you have a lot of data out there. You have people that are not necessarily able to put that data together, and you have the self kind of experts out on TV again to explain exactly what they're saying on the data, which was a lot of times wrong. So my advice to everybody is, be a wary consumer of information. The press releases from the government and from TEPCO from, oh, I'd say two, three months into the casualty to today, if you go on those websites, it's amazing how much information is out there. And they tell it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so my first takeaway here is probably something you didn't see or hear about, and that is, the real trustworthy sources of information are the central government, the government of Japan, and TEPCO, the evil industry there. Those guys are really truly the experts. It's pretty amazing what they've been doing. So this next section is really important to me because it's personal. There were, I can't go through a brief like this and not talk about some of the heroic efforts of the people there. But here's the first picture of waves crashing in into the site. This tank is about two, two stories tall, and this little minivan is the size of a normal minivan. Right? So the water's coming in, it continues to come in. I'm sorry. And there's that two story tank, and there's that minivan. And then the last picture is when the water's all run out. There's the tank again, and there's that minivan. Right? And so this is the condition of the site right after the tsunami came in. The lights went out. So the workers hooked the batteries. These are rows of lead acid batteries that they hook into the different instrumentation panels so they can get something. And it's part of the emergency response, so it's not like this is completely outlandish. Those batteries are supposed to last about eight hours. But let's uh, paint the picture again of these heroes. They, they face great risk, and some of their words describe the situation best. In the midst of the tsunami alarm, when we couldn't even see where we were going, we carried on working to restore the reactors from where we were, right by the sea, with the realization that this could be certain death. There are many who haven't gotten in touch with their family members, but are facing the present situation and working hard. Everyone at the power plant is battling on without running away. So my question is, would you do this? And notice that in this picture, these guys are trying to hook up power lines again to get power back to the reactors. And they're in radiation suits while they're doing it. So would you do this if the ground looked like that? While laying cables down and tailing the circuit penetrations and terminal treatment work, we were terrified that we might be electrocuted due to the outside water poles. Fukushima Daiichi plants one through three suffered meltdowns. These heroes continue to work all the while buildings were exploding and the radiation levels drove, uh, rose dramatically. The firefighters and first responders I'd like to give praise to also, uh, and the men and women of the Japanese Self-Defense Forces who were also heroes. They courageously pitched into the nuclear crisis not knowing a thing about radiation risks. But in the back of everyone's mind is, if you remember the last nuclear crisis we had in the world was Chernobyl. And when people ran into Chernobyl, some of them did not come back out alive. And so they thought they were on suicide missions. Then also for the defense forces, they had to comb territories and look for bodies and haul them out. And that's, that in itself is, is pretty traumatic. So my takeaway is that heroes, heroes aren't born. They're just normal people doing the right thing at the right time. They step up. And they, there's a lot of people out there that stepped up. 
All right, before talking about the accident scenario itself, let's just talk about the accidents that didn't happen. If you look up on the screen, a little bit of data, Fukushima Daiichi had six reactor plants. Three of them melted down. Fukushima Daini, the sister plant to the south, had four reactor plants, and they were all saved. And Onagawa, all of those three reactors were saved. That's it up here to the north. It was the closest reactor to the actual earthquake. It also saw the 50-foot tsunami. But the, the major difference is, is when they built the Onagawa plant, the company that built it said, you know, we have to think about tsunamis. And they built it at 15 meters. So they pretty much escaped without any damage. And, the, and they brought the power back up online, and they were up and running right after, after the earthquake, pretty soon after. They didn't necessarily have a place to distribute the electricity, though, because there's a lot of places that got wiped out. In the sister plant to the south, the four reactors at Fukushima, Daini, those guys were heroes, too. And, and they managed to save those four plants. They were, those pictures I showed about the tsunami flood, that was actually from Daini, not from the, the ones that had the reactors. Very similar situation, same layout, same situations. But they were able to haul cables around and get uh, one diesel generator hooked up to the right place and uh, get things back working again. All right, now we're going to talk about the reactor. Right in the center is what we call a reactor pressure vessel. That is the big steel structure that holds the core in the middle and the water, and that's the main body of protection they have against leaks. And then surrounding that, in every nuclear plant, we have this thing called a containment structure. And this one is kind of unusual. And you might have heard this in the news called the light bulb, because it kind of looks like an outside light bulb, but it's called a drywall. And it's just there if the other thing leaks, okay, the big steel containment thing leaks. And it's there for other, other reasons, but it's mostly there to protect against leaks. And then below that, supporting it, is this thing called a torus. It's a big donut full of water that's connected to the drywall. And the purpose of the torus is to make sure that if it has a suppression uh, amount of water in it, um, something like 300 gallons, 300,000 gallons of water that's sitting in there so that if you do have a leak or something hot, then it has some cold water can be suppressed too. Um, another thing you heard about are the spent fuel poles, perhaps. Spent fuel is something that we do with the fuel that comes out of a reactor during um, they're refueling out this, and we have to stick them somewhere because they're pretty warm still. We stick them in these swimming pools. These are open swimming pools and the uh, beautiful pools. I mean, the water is really clear and clean, but you probably won't want to swim in it. <laughs> Highly radioactive um, uh, control rod, or excuse me, uh, fuel rods are cooled off in those ponds for up to about three to five years. All right, and then the other part on this picture here is this. I, I drew these in. Okay, so this is a, a pink meaning steam and a light blue meaning water returning. So you get pink steam coming out on the turbine building, creating power, you got water returning and the light blue. And I'll just make note of that here. All right, let's, but the, before we go on and talk about the accident, Kate's really important idea. A reactor, a reactor is, uh, is unlike most power sources where if you turn off the key, turn off the fission rate, it's still producing a massive amount of power. And it's on the order of, if you look at this graph, that peak up there is about 7% of its normal 100% operating power. So if this reactor is operating at, and we'll use some number like one gigawatt thermal KO, then at the end of it, seven, uh, 700 megawatts is still being produced in the second that we turn off fission, right? And then about after a minute, it drops down to 1%. But it goes on for days. So if you look at the drop off, this heat is generating is pretty massive as it goes out for days. And this graph will continue to go out if I draw it out. So there's still heat being produced. And as I said before, those spent fuel rods are stuck in this, that pond for about five years to let it cool down to the point where we can stick them in a can and they basically self cool by the air that's around. Okay? So the, the battle is on. In a reactor, we want to make sure that all this heat that's being generated, you can still take it out. So there's a lot of systems. In there. All right, a, norm, a normal emergency uh, shutdown. The earthquake occurs. There's sensors on the reactor plant that says, "Hey, we just had an earthquake beyond a certain limit," and so it automatically shuts down. So the control rods are driven in by what we call it's a reactor scram, shuts down the fission, but it doesn't shut off that decay that's still going on. 
In the meantime, so we scrammed the plant, shut off the fission, and, and we isolated. So we shut off valves from that's going to the turbine building and shut off the valves that are coming back from the turbine building. And the reason why we do that is for the most part, everything is still pretty good in a reactor plant. What we don't want to do is lose water. Because that decay heat, in order to take it out, we need the water. So this is a conservation of water issue. And it's also to make sure that we don't excessively put a lot of thermal stresses on the plant. And the last thing is we start this thing called core cooling. This is a, a backup system. This is a real cartoony picture. It's very complex uh, because there's so many different ones that operate on different plants. But essentially what it does is it takes some of that steam, that decay heat out, turns another turbine, doesn't need a lot of electrical power, and pumps water back into the core. All right, that's, so the idea is we want to just make up, uh, use up that heat, and we want to keep pumping water in. So all those things are working just fine and dandy. Uh, as time goes on, the temperatures and the pressures in the plant rise. And this is also an expected effect because of this decay heat. So we're still cooking off water and boiling it, and the pressure's going up. And at some point, because we're not taking it out to the turbine, this pressure's building up, and we have these things called steam reliefs that relieve. And they relieve the pressure to keep things from, from breaking. But this is by design, and that pressure that's relieved, steam goes down, it goes into that torus, that cold water down there. And so that cold water is quenching all the steam, keeping everything at a reasonable level. And this can go on for several hours uh, in this condition. Everything was going in accordance with plan, but there was a big problem. It was called the tsunami. Uh, one thing I didn't say is that the diesel generators, the electrical site power did get shut off during the earthquake. They lost electrical power to the site. And we have these backup diesel generators that come up that were running in the basement. They, they were supplying electrical power, so all these systems that we were just talking about were just operating normally. Every, the lights were on, things were going just as planned. When the tsunami hits, the problem is all the diesel generators, which were in the basement of these particular reactors, got flooded. And they shut down. And the, the site lost all electrical power. They only had those batteries that I showed you later on pulled out and hooked them up. So that was the only source of electrical power that they had. But the other problem was just the diesel's getting wiped out. You could maybe bring in you know, your little Honda gas car diesel, plug it in, maybe it could work. The problem is also that all the electrical switch here. So even if you had another power source you could plug in, it was in underwater. The tsunami wiped out all the roads going in, so they couldn't even get um, the back up there. There was no cavalry coming for those guys. So what happens so is, is because we lost power, we lost the ability to pump water, we don't have electrical power, we can't sustain that other thing forever, and the water level drops in the, in the core. It exposes the core, and that's when the core starts heating up, and overheating. It also starts putting a lot of steam into the areas that we don't have a lot of high temperatures. That quenched water is starting to get pretty hot in here. So the pressure in this light bulb is going up. The core is getting uncovered. That's bad. The core starts heating up. The pressure in the in this light bulb gets in the primary containment gets so high that it starts venting steam off. Which is okay. It's again something that we expect to do. But the problem they had on these plants is that normally this vent goes out to a stack outside in one of the pictures of the flood picture you could actually see part of the stack but it also um, because of poor design it takes electrical power for those fans to pump it out of the stack so instead of going out to the stack this uh, pressure of the steam started building up in the reactor building itself now we started having core damage my little cartoon there something's starting to melt radioactive elements coming into the water, going down in the steam, going down in the turrets, steam coming back up, going out, and going up in the reactor building. The other problem with core damage is when the temperature gets up to a certain level, you have this thing called water reaction with zirconium. Zirconium is a clad for the fuel. And when you have this water reaction with, with the zirconium cladding, it's great material until you get up to about 20, 25 degrees out. Then it oxidizes and creates hydrogen, mm -hmm. just like if you know your chemistry, from, you throw a little bit of sodium into water, and you get generate a lot of hydrogen. And that's where all the hydrogen came from, was all this metal that was in the core, reacting with the steam and water, creating hydrogen. Well, everything's fine, hydrogen is okay in there because it didn't have any oxygen. 
But this path that we kept down here, pumped it back out, stuck it in here, leaked out into the reactor building. All the hydrogen was only the radar to fit the products were going up into the building. Right? And then what came next? If we saw this on TV2, we had the big explosions. The buildings exploded and went off. The hydrogen exploded really did all this damage to the buildings. This was bad. Did very little damage to the reactor. Did very little damage to the spent fuel. But it, if you took a picture from it, you see that all these girders and beams and panels and the structure of the building fell into the spent fuel pool. And there was some concern there that we could have damaged the fuel that was in the spent fuel pool, or that we could actually damage the pool and have those leak, and then those cores would heat up and melt. So there was a lot of concern over that. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. So as you recall, as I mentioned, the main goal is to keep that core cool. So not having the normal systems operate they found, and I don't, I don't know precisely where, but there are other pipes that come out of the turbine building and go back into the plant that they were able to hook up fire, fire trucks to. So they pumped right out of the sea, pumped it through a fire truck, pumped it through this fire connection, ran it up, and they were able to trickle water into plants, all the plants. So they still, we started pumping seawater in there, and finally, with enough water going to the plant, temperatures started to stabilize. So we're talking several weeks of this um, before we can start breathing easy. So the steam that was leaking out is a thing over a long period of time, which was causing the distribution of fission products all over the land over a long period of time. And the water that was going in, we finally got to where we, instead of seawater pumping in there, we were able to use fresh water from the rivers. So the idea is, we keep pumping water in, and we want to fill this whole thing up with water. That's what we were thinking that we wanted to do. That's the goal. Fill that thing, pump water in, fill it all the way to the top, then breathe a little easier. But after weeks of pumping water in, we had no indication that there was any pressure pushing back on what we were pumping in. And the other thing that was going on is, this turbine building over here, the basement of the turbine building, even though it was flooded from the, from the tsunami, the radiation level of the turbine building was going up. And what it became really clear is the water in the basement was getting very radioactive down here, and it was leaking over the turbine building basement. And all this, all the water we're pumping in, were basically somehow leaking out into the basement to fill the basements up of this plant. So what were we to do then? And and by the way, I, I this this picture is not quite right, but there wasn't water up there. It was only trickling in up on top of that core. All right. So the idea is, wow, we got a lot of contaminated water going in the turbine buildings. Those are going to fill up. What are we going to do? Well, let's start putting them in tanks. So they went in Tupco went in the tank business. Lots of tanks, tank companies were making a lot of money on them. Uh, also, in the meantime, while we're building these tanks, every building on site, they pumped the, the seawater out, and then we started pumping all this dirty water in, all this radioactive water. Every building basement was used as a tank. And after a lot of extra work and help, they finally got a contamination cleanup system, so they built these massive filtration systems to take the radioactive contamination out of the water as best as they could. And really, in the end, we have this sort of weird, ingenious core coin system, right? So this is how it works. We pump water in, somewhere in there, it gets somewhere in and cools down enough where we're getting temperatures dropping, and then it leaks down, and leaks through, and leaks into the basement, it leaks over a turbine building basement, we pump it over to another building basement, where the radar activity is a little lower, and then we put it through those big cleaning systems, we kick out some of the ugly waste. But we, now we have reasonably clean water, Come back with a few water system back in, and, uh, and the pumps that we're using are on these hoses and big pumps out on the parking lot. In the long term, the idea is we got to cover the buildings, take all the rubble out, take the spent fuel out, uh, start covering the ground with different materials so the radioactive, radioactive contamination doesn't go aloft on you again. So try to seal the basements. Um, Here's a picture of them putting a big building cover around it. And all this is done robotically because the area is so highly radioactive. 
One of the nice things is, um, and is since that time, is, is a couple of years ago, they were able to get all the spent fuel out of spent fuel pole number four, which was the hottest. That's all out now. And they transferred it over. And they were uh, they are just now, this month, they finished the, the building cover on reactor building three, and they're going to start pulling the spent fuel out of that spent fuel pool. Also. All right, building covers, robots, rubble removal. If you look up here, you know, it's a big video game. <laughs> Operators operating all these things by remote control. Lots of new robot technology came out of this. Uh, the other thing you may have heard on the news is this thing called site containment. There's a lot of effort in making sure that either seawater's not coming into the site, moving the groundwater, contaminated groundwater out, or groundwater's not pouring in and then moving out to sea. And so they're doing a lot of work to they're drilling wells and they're pumping them out and they're putting up this thing called an ice wall. I don't know if you've heard of that. Or they're drilling down and trying to freeze the water. So they have this. Water is a problem now. Go back to this cooling cycle. Well, it'd be nice on that cooling cycle if there was no other water, but unfortunately, groundwater keeps pouring in. So it leaks in the basement. Most basements aren't very tightly sealed anyway, but they have groundwater on the system. Those are the cables and the pipe trenches all over the site. So they have a fight where they get new water in. Fresh water, but when you dilute it with highly radioactive water, it's still very bad. It's also a place where there's a lot of typhoons. So it gets swarmed by a typhoon and you get a lot of rain, you get snow up in the mountains, runoff. So a lot of extra water. So the cycle's great, except now they're adding water from all these external sources and they just can't throw it away. They just can't drain it. So with all these excesses, they end up having to... Well, the next phase is, well, let's take this somewhat not very clean water. It's still not something you want to dump. And we've got another processing system. And the processing system is really good. It gets almost all the radiation out of the water, except for tritium. So they got more tanks, but this time you see it's clean. It's, it's got tritium and more tanks and more tanks and more tanks and more tanks. And pretty soon you got a tank farm, 800,000 metric tons and growing. Tritium is just a, an isotope. It looks just like hydrogen, except it's got a couple extra neutrons. We've got regular hydrogen over here. We've got deuterium here and we've got tritium here. Tritium is a little radioactive. It's one of these neutrons right there. In real simplistic terms, it kind of splits into this thing called a proton and electron. It's not exactly true, but that's the close enough. And that proton sits there and it becomes helium. Go here. Now you've got two protons. That's the next thing in the elemental table. But what happened about electron? An electron is spit out. It's called a beta particle. And it shoots out at a very low level of energy. Very low. It's like AT, KUV, I think. That helps you. So it is radioactive. It's not real bad. It's pretty harmless. We make it all the time in the atmosphere. Cosmic rays make the tritium. So we're getting we're getting dumped with tritium all the time. But we have to store it. Because the government of Japan and the public will not allow them to release the tritium. And so they're storing it. And most experts will tell you the best plan for it is just release it. A little lot of time, maybe not at once. I mean, if you think about the number they have, we get 10 to the 16th of these tritium atoms created in the Earth every year. And they got like 10 to the 14th, uh, you know, 1% of that. So, of tritium. So, I mean, just relative terms, it's really kind of minor. And for the most part, it's pretty harmless. Tritium does like to sit in water, though. That's why we can't get rid of it. It becomes one of the hydrogen atoms. So to speak, in water, we've got heavy water with the we've got super heavy water with tritium. We're not really concerned about tritium, is if you look at the drinking water stands throughout the world, they're all over the place. Yes. And the reason why they're all over the place is because there really isn't a lot of harm to it, but somebody just decided we gotta put a number out there for the public. Okay. And so I think the tank thing is not a good idea. If you imagine having all these tanks, you gotta make sure that you know, you're taking measurements of them all. And that's people walking around outside that's pretty radioactive. So the takeaway here is reactor conditions are in cold shutdown. It's the best plan possible. The experts from the U.S., when we were over there, 
we looked at the plan. We had a lot of ideas. The Japanese had their own. We shared a lot of information. And for the most part, their plan is excellent. But it's going to be still a long haul. We're seven years in. All right, why do we care about reactor accidents? It's only real reason that we care is because of the rate of logical conditions. I'm going to give a little shout out to the military here. Because we were there and we had all this equipment, we had a bunch of nukes, we started doing surveys of the land. So we were able to map out the extent of the radioactive contamination in the early days. This is the first set of surveys that we took to show that in this red area, that's really where the highest contamination was. And that's pretty much where they started evacuating people in Japan. This picture is also old. It uh, was taken eight months after the accident. Uh, we did a bunch of surveys. The Japanese took over the, the survey process with helicopters and airplanes. And uh, there's that little area of red. Blue is background. Light blue is barely above background. But red is bad. And so what we really have in Japan is two Japans. You have this little area and that is shrunk down a little bit now because of the cleanup efforts. But those guys, those people are very much affected. So that's still a very much a casualty for them. But the rest of Japan and the rest of the world, we can just move on, right? We're in Tokyo, we got dusted. We got radiation, it's on the ground, you can measure it, it's on my car, it's on my clothes, I'm breathing it. Am I gonna die? Okay? A really important question to answer. So here we go. We got Japan is, is, a, is a little bit more radiological sensitive to us. Sensitive. They have monitoring stations all over the place. We don't quite have that in the United States. We have a little bit, but not a lot. You see the readings. The, the green is the historical normal band, but the readings of the event occurred like this. And you can see at some point a day after the explosion or so, we got this you know, pretty massive release, but nothing really stuck on the ground. Then uh, another major release, and some of it stuck. You can see decay away. And over a long period of time, this is I think seven months of data right here, you can see it kind of stabilized out. Right? What does that mean? All right, radiation is all around us, that's average Joe. We get radiation causing rays from space. We get it from the rocks and in, in, uh, in concrete. We get a little radiation from this building right now. We'll call that external sources. Then we have other sources, body sources. Your body's radioactive. So what I what I like to tell people, if you want to get away from this, the cosmic rays and concrete and earth and bodies, you know, like sleeping next to your spouse or something, go on a sub nuclear submarine. When I was a nuclear submarine, I got much less radiation than all you guys. Sleeping next to a reactor. Right? You also get it from food. And so what add up? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, radon. The biggest contributor to our whole body dose is from radon, and that's breathing. So you want to stop. Radiation, stop breathing. It's no simple way, right? That's the internal stuff. Then we got the medical and dental, we'll call that man right? I'm going to throw some numbers at you. 0.3 millisieverts from cosmic rays, 0.2 millisieverts from all the rocks. Breathing radon, wow. Food in your body, another 0.3. So these are all the ones that you can't stop. And But you can stop going to the doctor, do not get that. Okay, and, and frankly, you know, the youth don't get this kind of stuff because they don't get CT scans. So that total average Joe, yeah. What, what do you mean by flights? Oh, airline flights? Is that? Yeah, airline flights. Uh, you're closer to cosmic rays. You don't get the protection of the Earth's atmosphere as you go up in ele elevation. So if you fly an airplane, you get a higher dosage. Astronauts get a lot of this. They're off the charts. So what what do we can, what can we measure? We don't measure all that stuff, right? We can only measure the stuff we got on handheld radiax the Tokyo uh, picture there. So we don't measure the medical that you get. You know, we don't measure food or your body or breathing radon. We don't measure that. So what do we, what do we got left? We only got thrust and cosmic. So any detector that you see reading something is only the external sources that it's reading. Right? So if you look at this, this is about 5, 0.5 millisieverts. So we're going to do some math here. If you do 55 nanosieverts per hour and do all the calculations, it comes out to be about 0.5 millisieverts per year. I went back and let me just, what was our, what was our whole dose that I totally remember? I didn't tell you to remember this problem. It was six, right? Our whole body every year, every average dose gets six. So half of that, half a millisievert of that six is just from the ground. We call it ground time. 
That's what we meant. And so if you look at this Tokyo graph again, okay, there we are, peak up, we're down here, and you follow this graph, and you it over here, and that's about 55 milliseconds. It's about what average Joe gets. And this is contaminated from the ground. So it's 35, beat it to 500, get a little extra stuff, but it ends up about 55. Right. So we know now that, you know, there we are at average Joe. If we got to that peak that I showed you, you know, that's what we would get. We would get, holy cow, we get five millisieverts here just from the ground. Okay? But that all decayed away. And there we are. So average Joe Tokyo now gets, average Tokyo Joe gets, you know, 0.5 or 0.6 millisieverts from an additional 0.1 from the extra radiation from the crisis. And now that's pretty much gone anyway. All right. Here we are across the world. Uh, different countries have different ground shines, so to speak. Sopho is way over here. Seattle, we're pretty low. We're at 0.3 millisieverts instead of average Joe being 0.5. Tokyo Joe is 0.5. New York is 0.9. Hong Kong over here. Do I have Denver? I don't have Denver. Denver's an out. Oh, that's because it's, it's in the background. Yeah, Denver ought to be up here somewhere. Um, there's Fukushima. This is after the accident. That's their ground shine. And then there is this place in India called Kerala, India. And they have a lot of flooring sand, and so they get a little bit more dose than most people do. That's all the time. Right? And I'll put things in perspective. There's, that, there's our whole dose that we got, the six millisieverts. There it is. Green in Tokyo. Green on Tokyo. And then uh, another comparison graph here. There's the average Joe at six millisieverts. There's non traveling Joe because he didn't get that. He doesn't go to the doctor either, so he doesn't get so much of this red stuff anymore. There's Rocky Mountain Joe. There's the Denver guy. Tokyo Joe's here. Hong Kong Joe's there. Smoking Joe, you know, you get a little. If you smoke, how many people smoke? Okay, good. It's not the radiation of okay, by the way. Um, and there's Fukushima right. So not too bad. But what's interesting is that if you look at this bar up here, this is. Fukushima guy getting well, with all that, and the long time our ground time, but he's getting 13 millisieverts a year. That's twice what you get, roughly. The EPA rule and most of the world protection agencies say we don't do anything to get to 20. We're not even there at Fukushima for taking protective action. Okay. And then, if you look at our other limit, 50, that's what your average radiation worker is allowed to get. That's not too bad either, right? So put everything in perspective, and you know that you know we have workers all over the world that get this. There's another one, right? So we set the emergency limits up. So that's kind of way off the chart. You know, all it is around here. There's another place in Iran that's up around here. And then I think uh, you know you spend six months in space. You're right around there. Astronauts get All right. So the takeaway is natural uh, radiation is natural. It's man-based all around. So now we can get away from it. Not to be afraid of. And the disaster really did not do a lot. The food, this is also a great concern of people all over there. What about all this contaminated food we're going to get? Are we going to be a problem about it? So we're going to go back and remember this little graph here. Food was normally in this area, that little purple area that we talked about. Um, the government of Japan said, we are not going to allow food out there with radiation. They put in this massive monitoring program and they set these limits. So here they are. I mean, they had stuff for adults, for young children, infants at different levels that were allowed to get. And that is, if you if you went and found all these things at the limit and went to the grocery store, which you couldn't find anyway, and you ate at the limit, you get five health secrets a year from food. Now remember, I already told you, you're getting six. So we're talking about eating contaminated food around the clock for a year you know, you're doubling your dose, which is about the same as getting like, you know, going to get a chest x or something. All right, so if we add five L secrets a year to all these people, like the guy in Tokyo and the guy in Fukushima, you see that, yeah, they get a little bit more. But even if I wanted to eat radioactive food, and I was in Japan, I couldn't find it. Um, in the U.S. also, we did we had our own ways of checking, and we did a lot of modern too. So I just like that. This is kind of a ponder point. I started thinking about this a lot. When we look at food and regulations and where we are, it's really more like guidelines. It's like the it's like the stamp date of your milk in your refrigerator. 
You know, you get to that scam date, holy crap, are you going to die from drinking it? No, you're only going to die if you wait. <laughs> I, I look on like overly zealous diet guidelines, this radiation limits. So you get some bureaucrat that says, okay, this is the limit we're going to set. So um, here's an example. Fat. Your doctor says your fat intake should only be 30 grams a day. And then you look at that Cinnabon. <laughs> the french fries you had, and you're like, wow, I just ate 35 grams of fat. You can keel over and die? No, no, we're not going to do that, right? But maybe, you know, after 40 years of doing that every day, you know, in my day, it was all about fat. Carbs are great. But, you know, we found out that we didn't quite have that right, that it's high fructose corn syrup stuff that we're getting that's actually killing us. So it's the same thing. We don't really have a lot of dietary guidelines on that, but probably we should, because that's probably killing a heck of a lot more people in radiation world. I think these things should be thought of as just guidelines. And I would challenge anybody that's really a zealot against radiation in their food. I'm going to ask them, are you really good with your diet? That's the first question. Are you being a hypocrite? This last takeaway is air, food, and water are safe. Regulatory limits to control them, so they're really not safe to us. That takeaway slide hasn't changed in seven years. So what's next and what am I doing? Well, that whole Fukushima crisis said I didn't want to be a nuke. What it, does, what it did turn me into is somebody that looked at energy, because in the Navy I didn't really look at it very hard. Climate change, and global warming, and carbon dioxide. And, and I said, I'm retired from the Navy. I'm going to be one of these startup solar wind guys. That's me. Charge head first into something. You know. I had a biochemistry degree, we're going to make algae. You know, the more I look, the more I realize is those things are niche. They're not going to get us the power we need. And the only thing that's going to do it for us is nuclear, unfortunately, if we don't want carbon. Right? So, what I want to do now, so what I am doing now, is um, there's new nuclear technology out there that hopefully we can bring to the fore that won't have the same kind of accident risk that these other reactors have. I have other different issues, but you know, if I can make a reactor so it's already melted down, it's called molten salt reactor. That's what I'm trying to do right now. Yeah, so, so the very red area, that's very close to the sea. We know that the world's ocean, they, they mix, what's the, what's the dose right now? Just think of table salt, seawater, think of seawater, and, and the salt in the seawater is radioactive. And if you spread it on the ground and the, and the water dries up, the salt sticks. It doesn't go anywhere. And then and the same thing we found on our ships. So we had some of the salt on our ships. We couldn't scrub it off. It was really hard. So it sticks to the ground pretty well. It's not running off uh, continuously. What's, the problem is we have the radioactive substances in the basements of those reactors. And the water's coming in and it's leaking out to the groundwater. So, as I mentioned, that TEPCO drilled a lot of wells around, they're pumping the water out, back out, so that the water doesn't run from the basement. It has to go to those wells before it gets to the ocean. So they're stopping the groundwater from proceeding out to the ocean. But they, it's, that's only, you know, probably a 95% solution. And, it, and certainly that didn't happen in the first year. So this groundwater, contaminated groundwater, kept going out to the ocean. And so it went to the harbor. And the picture I don't have is that they're in a harbor, and these I won't say seal up the harbor, but they put curtains in, they collected the silt off the bottom, and they started putting in these radioactive, it's called zeolite, so it absorbs, if you're a chemistry person, you know it absorbs the salts, the radioactive salts that are coming out. So as they put these curtains in place and they keep pulling out and recycling this. So they're really trying very hard to stop anything from going in the water. And for the most part, they're pretty successful. But they're not stopping everything, and that's your concern, I would suppose, right? That there is something that goes in the water. In fact, if you look at that red spot, that just happens the wind was blowing that direction that day. And I think the estimate is two-thirds of it was blowing out to sea during those releases. So most of that radioactivity went to the ocean already. So we dumped a lot already during the first several weeks of the cast months. I know how much was it. Uh, yeah, there's there's the estimates, but I mean it's something like you know something several one to the you know seventeenth becquerel or some number mm -hmm. like that. It, it's it's something that's mind blowing, and I don't you know that 
that my, my brain is not small enough to go more than about three orders of magnitude in the direction. So it's a lot. It's a lot of uh, contamination, but it's a lot of ocean. So not to steal Reed's thunder or anything, but for context, actually, if you look at the total uranium supply in seawater globally, there's actually 4.5 billion tons of uranium dissolved as different salt compounds within seawater. And if you look at the natural abundance of uranium-235, which is bomb uranium, which is about 0.01%, uh, so that's one in every, one that, one in every 10,000 um, atoms will be uh, uranium-235, that's still half a million tons of U-235, way more than humanity could ever produce, just lurking in the seawater. And uranium is extraordinarily heavy, uncommon element. So when you look at the natural abundances and amounts of different um, other elements like cesium, strontium, etc., you know, seawater is actually quite naturally radioactive on its own. It's not going to be that big of a deal. There's no way, even if we took every nuclear reactor, melted it down, and threw it into the ocean, long term, it's going to be fine. And so, but I'm not drinking seawater, but I might be eating fish. Right. Did they test the fish? Yes. What did they find? And we do test fish. Though. What did they find? The, the data is really spread out. And, and I like to tell people, fish just don't hang around. They go where the food is, right? Where their food is. And so the fish that you catch locally may not be the fish that have been feeding off the bottom. So the, 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 the greatest risk of fish would be like crabs that were on the bottom, that sit in the, the bottom of the harbor. But for the most part, most, like especially like tuna, tuna is migratory, it just moves. Uh, so, so where you catch the fish doesn't really matter that much. But there is a lot of testing going on. And for the most part, they don't even get close to the provisional level of food that we're talking about. But for the most part, some of the inland fish did. So the red zone, I assume, looking at that legend, exceeds 190 microsieverts per hour in the red zone. And is that November of 2011? Actually, that's 19 micro uh, microsieverts there, I think. That's, that's a 2011 graph. Okay, so if you were to do this over today, it, we'd all be blue, or what, I don't know what the decay rates are. No, what not. would it be? Is it still red there? There, yeah. There's there are pieces of red that are like that are very spotty. It's spotty, spotty, spotty red, and there are places that they will probably never able be able to. Well, certainly within decades, have people go back to. And what nuclide is responsible for that? Mostly, it's cesium one thirty seven. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. Just, just another point that people, there, there, you, you will hear people talk about, we've killed more people evacuating than you know, radiation. And there is, it's exact, that, that's a true statement. But uh, the problem that the government had and the problem that we were in policy making have is what do you tell people? Yeah. That they have to stay? You know, do you force people that are completely uncomfortable living there? And so those that will move, can move, will move. Um, and then you have to say, for example, let's say you have a family and all the doctors and teachers left. Mm. What kind of living is that, right? And so there are decisions that people have to make. And so therefore, one of the things that the government did is, is okay, we're going to evacuate this area. And this is part of the reason is because if you, you can't just leave, for example, folks that need nurses, you know, at home, you can't leave them alone. They got to have support, and the support all moves out, and nobody's bringing things to them. You know, they're actually harmed, and so that's the balance that you have to make when you're doing a policy decision about evacuation or no evacuation. Right? Um, I understand the Japanese government closed down most or all of the uh, nuclear reactors after the accident, and that the, some have been restarted. And how many have they restarted, and what do you think the prospects are for getting them all going again? I don't know the answer to that, but you're right. They shut them all down, and I think they got five back in the seven years. Uh, they did have some issues from a structural programmatic standpoint on how they were going to regulate safety. Their culture of safety is a little different than the culture of safety that we have in the United States that we are more of an over-the-top regulator, where they were more like people that lived there, regulators, that, that worked with the industry people. 
So that they, there was a difference in the mindset. And so one of the things that they learned is they need to bring up their regulation strength and put it in the right places, the right, the guy that was ahead of their nuclear uh, regulatory area, the one that we dealt with all the time, he was, he was the lead guy and he was an oil and gas person. <laughs> Right, and, he, and the other part of his hat was not just nuclear regulatory, but he also had like a, the equivalent of uh, like an OSHA for oil and gas. So he's an energy safety guy, which is you know something we don't do at all here. And so one of the things that we brought to them in the United States is this is how we think you know structure the regulatory environment. And so when we did that, we also looked at all the nukes in America. We looked at nukes in Europe. Everybody that had a regulatory body looked at it and said, okay. Uh, this we just can't walk away and so, say, you know, we, we are all okay. And so there was sort of like, you know, how we did with the banks that they had to go through this massive process of reevaluating whether they had the right strength and procedures. And, and many reactors across the world shut down temporarily so they could prove to their regulators they're back up on stuff. And for Japan, it's a little more painful because they also have to get prefectural governments and the public approval before they restart the reactor. So there is a slow uh, going for that. So I've actually got a question about um, the tritiated water. Tritium and helium-3 are quite valuable to fusion research um, as potential fusion fuels. Um, is the Japanese government ever going to move on disposing that water? Or, you know, is there regulations that are already in place for what to do with that water? Or could, say, an interested fusion company or researcher kind of swoop in and purchase that water? Uh, I would say a couple of things. One is the reason why it's still, the treating is still in the water is because it's so extremely difficult to take out. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that push comes to shove, it's expensive to do that. Uh, energy intensive to do that. And so uh, if they could, it would, right? They pull the tritium out and dump the water. Are there any measures taken to prevent further or future events like that in Japan or in the whole world, like for reactors directly built at the ocean? Uh, that's not, that, the ocean issue is a piece, but uh, yeah, just sort of anecdotally here, I, I mentioned there was that one plant that survived with no problems, right? Why were the base? Why were the diesel generators in the basement of these reactors? You might ask yourself. Why would Why would you do that next to the ocean with a tsunami concept? Well, that is a, an American designed reactor mm -hmm. by GE. And when GE's building these reactors, we do it along rivers. We do it on, we, we put reactors because you need the cooling water. That's why you do it near a water source. And so you build these reactors where you can. It just so happens we build most of our reactors in the south. And the south has these things called tornadoes. <laughs> and if you want to protect your electrical grid and your diesels, you're not going to put them above ground. You're going to put them in the basement of your reactor building. Mm. So you take that same concept and that design, you would go over to Japan, which has a very different <laughs> set of circumstances, and you don't think it through well enough, and you end up getting that design. And, and oh, by the way, the reason why plants five and six survived is they had one diesel generator that wasn't in the basement, it was air cooled. So they were able to get power, haul cables like those guys up in the, maybe not quite like that, but haul cables across the ground, get them plugged in so that they got systems back working before anything had, had a significant catastrophe. So in answer to your question, Part of it is you got to make sure your design is going to work, right, for the circumstances you're in. So it's not so much being next to the ocean. But the other thing is they are they've taken a major major turn in Japan over safety and what they had to do in place to get guys certified so they could screw it. So there's a lot of measures taken, and even in the United States we've done a lot. Uh, you remember I told you about the hydrogen explosion, right? I mean, this crisis would have been different with just those buildings that blow up. It would have been a little bit easier to attack this problem. In the United States, about 15 years ago, we created this thing where those pipes, as vents, they had to be hard, not like a ventilation pipe a duct. In Japan, they didn't have that rule. So these ventilation ducts going out to the tower, they leaked because they didn't have fans that drop through. And so therefore, all that leakage went into the record building. In the United States, we had put in a rule in place that those have to be hard piped all the way out to the stack. 
So if this building had been, uh, this reactor had followed the US code that was later initiated after these things were built, they wouldn't have had the hydrogen explosion. So I mean, there are there are a lot of things that were that people are thinking about that are smart guys. I mean, it's, uh, it's a, a pretty impressive thing that 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 gets built into these things. But in my opinion, there's been a lot of great work done also. What's the public opinion in Japan right now about nuclear energy? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure it's quite mixed, and there's people with great emotions. Oh, hey, can open the can answer that question? Yeah, I'm a Japanese. Uh, the majority of Japanese is pretty anti-nuclear now. So you were you were with uh, nuclear submarine, right? And and the United States has been uh, on the whole, I think, remarkably successful with their nuclear-powered submarines, both boomers and, and attacks like and so on. Right. And so we take a reactor and we put it in a submarine for God's sake, and right. it can stay down forever and on and on and on. And so so is there is there some missing transfer of technological red teaming uh, safety awareness of planning care here between civilian reactors and mm. military use i would say no i mean there's a there's a it's two different worlds when i was on my navy show and i had any problem at all in the rack plan i mean it could be like a little relay that wasn't working right and we couldn't figure out how to fix it or something I can pick up the phone and call the reactor's headquarters, and they get teams of engineers together, and they'll scratch through and they'll give you the answer, or they'll fly teams up to go fix it. Mm. Because you can spend a lot of money on the nuclear Navy. Don't talk about that. <laughs> um, but it's because they knew exactly what my plan looked like. Mm. They knew exactly where every pipe was, every valve was, every switch, everything, because we built up the certain spec. They had the specs for every ship in their offices, they had the experts who built it and designed it there. The civilian nuclear power world, that's not how it works. The civilian nuclear power world, they have that, what I said it was designed by GE, right? But that was basically the building and some other stuff. But now you go out to a site and you say, okay, how are we going to stick that on the site? So you can stick the building on the site, but all the other support equipment, the parking lots, the wires, the cables, the power lines, the pipes, the cooling systems, all have to be built and designed by the people there because it's a different thing. So when I asked my friends at the NRC, I said, we're on the US team, I go, okay, let's call somebody. They said, oh, they're all working at the TEPCO plant because that's who the experts are. Those guys, you know, I served two years on a submarine and then I'll go somewhere else and I have two years on another submarine and go somewhere else. So my expertise on that one plant was two years here, two years there. Their expertise is 30-year guys that have been there for the whole time. They know every valve, every switch, everything that happens. They know everything that's on the plant. The experts are there, they're nowhere else. So nobody called. That's one that's the one main difference. The other thing is these are huge compared to the old tiny submarine ramp. And so I didn't like it being on the aircraft here. I thought those things were big, you know. We have nuclear power plants on aircraft carriers too. And I'd walk around and go like, I don't like this, they're too big. Because on a summer, you could smell everything that's going on. <laughs> you could hear it and smell it. On um, these aircraft carriers, I was a little unhurt by that. But our aircraft carrier records are tiny compared to these. That's the other thing. And they operate, the Soviet plants operate 100% power all the time. They did. Whereas on a summer, you run and drills, power up, power down, you know. We had, we had to worry about the dynamics of the ocean. There's all the things that we had to do on a submarine, which is like running a sports car compared to this 18 more. All right, um, if there are no further questions, let's thank Reed again for everyone.